Hello and welcome to series three of my podcast, Innovation, where we get to hear stories and experiences of incredible women from diverse backgrounds and perspectives in science and technology. Our conversation gives us insights into some fascinating innovations, but we also get to relate because here on Innovation, I give women a platform to be heard and seen because this exact conversation is in video format on YouTube. And honestly, every single episode is inspiring and uplifting in some way, shape or form because we hear about what these women have learned along their life's journeys, both personally and professionally. This week, I speak to Abigail and Donna, who are from SYSTEM. I'm Donna. And I'm Abigail. And we are SYSTEM. SYSTEM. (laughs) SYSTEM. Yeah. Great name. So tell me about the name, first of all, and what SYSTEM does. Um, We came up with the name because we are actual sisters, and we both do... STEM subjects or in STEM careers and we've always had a love for careers and during our degrees we kind of like used each other for support and we used to call each other every day um, to just encourage each other to to finish the courses and whilst doing that we realised that that support helps and it would be great to give that support to other females in the industry as being a female in the STEM industry isn't always easy. So um, that's why we came up with system. And yeah, it's just a play of words with sis, sis and STEM and system because we are a community and a system of support. It was a genius name. <laughs> and, <Thank> you. <laughs> um, you're addressing some really, really crucial things. Um, first of all, tell me about you guys because, you know, seeing women like you in STEM is not a common occurrence. So what are you doing in STEM? And yeah, let's start with that. What are you doing in STEM? Okay, for me, I have a PhD in biomedical science. So um, I did that uh, at Aston University uh, for three years, four years because of COVID um, and the whole pandemic. But um, I was studying aging and before then I was at um, King's College I did a master's in neuroscience and before then I was doing biomedical science I also as an undergraduate degree I also have two years experience in clinical trial research uh, where I was doing admin work and that was before I between my master's and my PhD so I've always been I love science and I've always loved um research and um yeah that's how I've got into my fields but currently I'm now into medical communications so basically we're just the middleman between um healthcare professionals and um and pharma companies essentially so um just helping to educate and inform um, doctors on new drugs out there and new technologies and new, new ways of testing um and all the um, clinical trials out there so and um yeah so I can't really do that um on lung cancer um and yeah so that's uh, the area I'm in right now badass don't know yeah. So the area I am in is engineering. So for my undergraduate, I studied mechanical engineering at Brighton. And currently now, I am almost finished with my master's in advanced mechanical engineering at Queen Mary's. And yeah, the dream is always to be an engineer from when I was quite young. So um, I've just been making my way to that goal. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Like, I mean, so much STEM between the two of you. Um, I'm so excited that, you know, engineering is a massive part of your story. Um, Why did you choose STEM? Because it's not a typical choice for women. um, And it's not a typical choice for women of colour. Um, I'm not so sure in the sort of like biomedical field, but certainly in mechanical engineering. So what gave you the confidence to say, yeah, this could be for me? Um, For me personally, um, I've always been really good at maths. I really enjoy maths. And I've also had a a creative side as well. So I was looking for careers when I was in secondary school to go into. And engineering is what popped up. And from doing that research, I knew that this is something I would want to 
pursue in the future and yes there's been a lot of opposition I was one of two girls in my physics class um yeah and even in my degree I was probably there was only about let's say five people of um, of color on the course and probably like two girls and yeah so it hasn't always been easy to not see yourself but for me if I don't break that barrier um no one else will and no one else will like kind of expose that world to other people so yeah I feel like it is a kind of guarded world but you kind of have to break it so that other people can know about engineering and it's not just um cars because a big misconception about engineering and mechanical engineering is that you are a mechanic I am not a mechanic um I I like to do my levels, um, so I wouldn't. I don't get greasy. Um, engineering is more about uh, problem solving and finding solutions, and there, there's so many aspects of mechanical engineering itself that um, unless you do your research, you would not know. So yeah, you just have to push so that other people can know that. Yeah. How about you, Abigail? Because um, I think it's not so bad in your area, your field, in terms of gender balance. Yeah, no, it's true. And actually, I see more females um, than males. But in terms of, um, but then in senior roles, you see more males. So as, you know, lecturers and, you know, um, senior management in industry is usually um, male. But then when it comes to being a woman of colour, um, yeah, that's where I had my issues because especially when I got into, from my, my master's, I started to see fewer and fewer and fewer of people that look like me. And um, I certainly didn't know anyone who had done a PhD before. Um, from the area that we grew up in South London, it's not the norm. So when you even tell somebody, oh, I'm doing a PhD, they look at you like, what? Like, when did you start or when like <laughs> how did you even get there but um it's something that I it was a it was a dream to be a doctor but it wasn't a dream to be a PhD like to have a PhD um and I realized very early on that medicine itself wasn't for me um and I you know I went through all the process and I, I didn't get the best grades uh, at A level and I, I thought my dream was over and then um, I, so I went into do biomedical science just to get a way to get into medicine. But when I finished again, I didn't do well in the entry um, exams. So I thought, okay, let me do a master's as well. Maybe after my master's, I might, um, you know, go back and <laughs> try and do medicine again for a fair time. But then during my master's, I really enjoyed um, research and was like, and then I found out about PhDs and how you can get sponsored. And that just became my new dream. And um, yeah, so I, I would say that I was encouraged by, um, I always um, talk about my science teacher from secondary school. She was a woman of colour and she pushed me hard. She really pushed me. And the school that I went to was not the best school at the time I entered in. They said it was the worst, worst school in the borough. And um, it was true. When I went there, the, it was, you know, the, a lot of it wasn't the, the best, but we had a great head teacher who really pushed um, the school and transformed the school from um, a poor school to uh, the best improved school in the in the area. So really, um, I was pushed by the science teacher. She would give me extra work that um, other people didn't have. And just so that because she saw potential in me that I didn't actually see in myself. Um, and anytime I would ask her, I'd be like, oh, Miss, do you think I, I can be a, a doctor? Because I was doing an applied science. Um, I wasn't doing the normal GCSE. And it, in ways, people thought that was easier. Um, and because it was just mostly coursework then and just uh, one exam I think um, at the end of the year and she she said yes even with this applied science qualification you can be a doctor she reminded me this all the time and so I always have that um, positive role model in science and, and reminded me always that yeah you can actually do it and you can do beyond um, what you, you do and also I think to going into King's College was a big con co um, confidence boost for me because once again, when I first um, applied for medicine, I went to an open day in King King's and I knew that I couldn't actually get into this uni with my grades, but I just went there just to, to see how it is. And I was like, oh, I would really love to come to this university. Um, but yeah, that was a big confidence boost for me. And I realised that, yeah, you can actually do. So that 
caused me to you know apply for PhDs because yeah I thought I could actually do this so yeah I don't know just listening to you I feel so proud of you both Oh, thank you. <laughs> like you've really like believed in yourselves and you've really pushed yourselves despite the odds um what do you think of each other oh. <laughs> well Abigail's like my best friend and I, I always say like if I didn't have the support of Abigail I'm getting a bit emotional um, <laughs> I don't think I would have got as far I would have given up like from from like my first degree because I don't think I'm as confident um, by myself, but having that support behind me has really pushed me to go further because I now understand that it's not, I'm not just doing it for me. Like, yes, I I love um, all these achievements, but there is a bigger picture here. And yeah, Abigail always reminds me of that. And it just, I just, what would I mean about Abigail? (laughs) I really feel the same as well, um, even though, like, Donna's my younger sister, but um, I asked for her for advice whenever, during my PhD, I was always calling her, crying over the phone, like, I can't do this, and she would encourage me, like, yes, you can, like, you deserve to be there, so she's been my biggest cheerleader, and I'm really proud of her with all her achievements, because, as she says, I mean, engineering field is not easy, especially as a black woman, but she, you know, she, against all odds, she, you know, plows on and continues and you know is is succeeding in the field and I just see so much potential I always tell her all the time that she can do anything um so yeah I think that's why we came up with this then because we wanted to to combine our dreams and just you know support each other um in another way apart from obviously being sisters yeah it's just incredible what you guys represent because when I hear you talking about what you studied, it does make me think back to my own experiences. And, um, you know, having done engineering myself, I, I have to say, like, I'm not really proud of it, but I was driven by this need to prove that a woman like me could do engineering. Um, what are you driven by? Because uh, I get a real sense that you're genuinely interested in what you're studying. So what drives you, first of all? Well, for me personally, it's the, the passion for engineering. And from seeing a, an idea come to, to actually be a physical product, I always love that process. So no matter how many people that will tell me that uh, I, I don't deserve to be there, I'm like, okay, but well, I know I'm good. So if you know you're good, what matters? Whatever anybody says doesn't matter. And yeah, like there's so many examples where um, I step into class and they'll be like, oh, um, are you sure you're supposed to be here? And it it, it is discouraging, but also having having her there and just like calling her up like if anything happens or if anything funny happens I'll just call her up immediately I'm like oh this person says this and she'll be like oh but Donna you know you're good you don't need to listen to that and that will kind of like push me so um just having in the back of my head like yeah just not to think about my circumstances not to think that oh you're a black woman in this Uh, because if you do start to focus on those things it does put you down because it's not like seeing, not seeing yourself in those places, especially um, the senior roles and stuff, or even like a senior lecturer. The first time I saw a black lecturer was at Queen Mary's, and that was a shock uh, that I've never seen a black female lecturer as well. So yeah, not being able to see yourself is sad, but the passion, if you know you're good at it and you love it, it shouldn't matter what anybody else says. Yeah, and then for me, my motivation comes from just being in the health uh, industry, helping people. Um, we all have, you know, family members and ourselves who've gone through, um, you know, who go through conditions, go to hospitals, um, are ill. And especially, I think my passion was for ageing. Um, and one thing I do, like, because the reason why I went to neuroscience was I just, I just love the brain. I just love how complex it is. But also love if that's the word how it can deteriorate and people you know someone who was so strong someone who was so you know capable can just in an instance that can be reversed and that like I really wanted to be part of the solution or of how we can you know um, improve age uh, old age old age health 
Um, and also, so I'm really just passionate about helping people um, and improving health. So that's how I got into, into science in general. And I'm just so interested in science. Like from a young age, from the age of, well, from secondary school, I've always been interested in how um, just the vast amount of um, things that science is involved in and um, just how the body works. And yeah, all that um, is really where my interest stemmed um, from. And then also just being um, in terms of, being a role model and showing other girls that you can do it because I my story is that I was the bottom of the class and I you know worked my way to the top of the class and then obviously to all these degrees that I have and um, I just want to show people that that can happen whether whatever your circumstances whatever area you're from whatever school you went to whatever qualifications you had as I said my A-levels were rubbish to be honest like I it, it took me a long time I had to even start pretending or I had a fake A-levels um, grades that I used to tell people that I got um, especially when I got to Kings and people would ask I would come up with this story of yeah I got you know B's and all that which was a lie but I had to do that because I was quite ashamed with my A-levels but proudly I can tell people now like you know yes I got um, D's and E's like, I can proudly say it because it's part of my story and it's part of what makes me who I am and is that's part of the drive just to not only prove to myself but prove to others that you can make it um you know wherever you're starting from and that science is not actually hard like um yes it is hard actually but <laughs> in terms of you can do it because I speak to you know young kids I've spoken to a seven-year-old before and she's told me that science is hard and I was just surprised I was like at seven years old, for you to say science is hard and you've not even started science at all, um, it's, yeah, I just want to break that that narrative that it is hard. It is hard, but everything's hard in this world and it's just hard work. And just once you you do love it, the, the understanding will come and it's, yeah, it's it, it, you're able to push through and actually achieve. Um, that is such a great message. And it just feels like you were motivated by a genuine interest. But what has come out of that genuine interest are true role models. Like the both of you represent um, something so crucial. And I want to try and put it into words because um, I see a lot of young girls and not just girls but you know we're living in a world where people are trying to be themselves and sometimes they don't feel accepted um they don't feel like they can truly be who they are because they've got to conform and what you two represent are people who did it anyway despite not being the norm so that takes a lot of inner strength it takes a lot of inner confidence and self-belief um what were the ways that you employed to kind of push through um, times where you felt really out of place? I would have a breakdown on the phone to Abigail. <laughs> and I think that kind of, sometimes you just have to uh, acknowledge your feelings. And before, um, I never used to speak to Abigail on the phone, about even about work. So before, during that time, I would be really upset and even like going to class. I'd be like, well, I don't understand. Why am I here? But I don't know. One day I just started speaking to Abigail and then I kind of like let it all out and it was no longer a burden on me. And I think a lot of girls out there, they carry that burden and they just hold it in and it's not healthy, number one. And two, you're not going to progress until you, you face your demons kind of thing. So for me, I would say um, let it all out and also um, getting advice from other people that have been in the field. Um, apart from Abigail, there was like other female friends that I made in the years above who'd give me advice on like what to do and like how to do things. And once I learned that, uh, it was a lot easier to do the course because yeah, it's just free information. And a lot of people kind of think you have to do it on your own, no you don't. There's so many people that have gone before us and have done it. And since they've done it, what is stopping you from doing it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, um, 
how I dealt, dealt with it is also the same thing. It's about community and speaking to the right people because sometimes, like especially during my PhD, I would speak to certain people and they just don't understand what um, I'm talking about. So I'll be like, oh, I'm really struggling and things. And they'll just be like, okay, well, anyway, I've written like, you know, 70,000 words, blah, blah, blah. And you're just like, no, I just really want someone who who understands me. But it's just getting the right friends around you and people that will encourage you. And as even the people that have not even done a PhD before, some of them um, I spoke to, I had a real um, support from my friends. But then there was other friends who had no clue. So you'll speak to them and they'll be like, oh, it's just, what, 6,000 words you need to write? And I was like, no, it's not. They're like, oh, what's taking you so long? Why can't you finish? And that kind of um, pressure, it adds to the pressure. Um, so it's all about speaking to the right people and, as you said, community. And that's one thing that I struggled with. I felt those times I really felt alone because, as I said, I, I moved to a new area, went to Birmingham, didn't know anyone and um yeah I was just I didn't know whether to be which, which Abigail to be basically to be the one that is came from Kings and you know is so smart or be the one that came from Brixton uh, South London and it, this is not the norm for um so you know I I realized that I can actually be my real self and you know just getting the right people around me and talking to talking it out as Donna said is really important because yeah if the more we bottle it in the, it's not going to help and it rather it really discourage you and you can end up just giving up because yeah it's, it's that's the reality of it but when you actually focus on the goal and focus on yeah where where you want to be and you know just remember always remember what motivates you and what drives you um it just makes it a little bit easier yeah I think you mentioned that you know talk it out and there may be skeptics um I was one of them back in the day where I would have said yeah but there just isn't anyone around to talk to but I think the key message is that there is always someone or people out there that can relate um and it's a question of searching for them because they do exist I mean when I think back to my days um, when I really needed to reach out and talk to people there just wasn't anyone around because I was in a really competitive environment and I didn't want to reach out for help or even advice or even just a chat because I didn't want to look like I wasn't coping um, but I think the message that you're conveying today and the message that I now know years later is that no matter what there are people around to talk to it's a question of finding them and sometimes it's not easy to find them but you know they are out there so I guess my next question is what does system offer like could people call you up you guys and be part of your sisterhood like what does system do yeah so that's that's the aim and that's the our biggest goal to network women to connect women together so um currently we do that through social media um particularly through um instagram so we've we're building a network of women who have been there before and women who are now coming up and you know maybe studying or maybe just came out of uni and we really want to help each other even though we may be all in different fields but we want to form a network where people can easily just you know yes contact if contact us if we don't know the answer we would just be like oh yeah we do know this person we do know this um woman she's been there before or she's got a she's got a network of her own um she's got an initiative where she helps people so yeah we we uh that's what our goal to just connect women together and um I think it's we want to do it in a environment where it's not so um I'd say rigid or strict or um uncomfortable because a lot of sometimes when you you're forced to network even in a work environment it can be a bit uncomfortable and just a bit like oh I don't want to talk I'm a bit shy I don't want to ask for help but we want to do um things whether it's through social media or it's through in-person events where we just make it relaxed and make it very easy to to talk with someone and you know just to to network and introduce yourself and yeah so we just want to create that you know, um nice <laughs> nice and friendly environment um to do so and yeah and then we also receive tips and advice from 
um, experts and people, you know, professionals, health, healthcare professionals or um, engineers or, what, or whatever in STEM. Um, and we're trying to collect all this. So we would release these tips every week um, just so that, you know, one, one day you might be on our page and just need some encouragement. Just, you know, click on one of our tips and just see the amazing advice that is given by people who've been there before. What would you say so far have been the best tips you've given out? Like, what would be examples? Uh, so one of our tips we were given by um, a lady that works in tech uh, as a software engineer. And one of her tips was just, just to, <laughs> you can apply for a job, whether you think that you actually qualify or not. Because a lot of times we hold on, we read this job description and we disqualify ourselves before we've even applied. And most of the time, sometimes these job descriptions are just very elaborate and you I could actually do the job, but it's just the way that the words have been put in on paper. Um, you just, yeah, you've disqualified yourself before trying. And she said, the worst they can say is no. And that's even helped me in my life. I'm like, yeah, actually the worst that someone could say is no. And if they say no, fine. like you know there's other opportunities and it's all it's all part of the experience of just you know try applying for jobs and all that so um I think that was a very good um good tip to give to to people to just not disqualify ourselves because I nearly did that with my current role I'm in it right now I said I saw the role and I said no way I can't do this I just came out my PhD I don't have no experience um you know and there's so much people higher than me and better than me cleverer than me that can do it um, but then, you know, I just applied for the role. And even during the interview process, I nearly gave up because I thought this is far beyond me. Um, but really, they they were really impressed with me and they really liked me for who I was. So if I now disqualified myself and blocked myself, I wouldn't be in the position I am now in. And truly, when I start the role, I could actually do, I can do the role. So, yeah, it's very important that we don't disqualify ourselves. And it's all about confidence, I think. Yeah, that's the, the main thing, like the confidence that we have in ourselves. And that's something we want to increase amongst um, girls like us. I mean, that is such an amazing tip. And honestly, it's like one of the key examples that I've heard over and over again. I think it was like a Harvard study where there was a job interview that had 10 different criteria. And um, a guy looked at the 10 criteria and had like four out of the 10 and was like, OK, I'm going to apply for the job and I'll just figure out the other six things that I don't know how to do um, once I get the job. Um, so much confidence. And then the girl looked at the 10 things and had like nine of the 10 things and said, I'm not going to apply because I don't have 10 things. So, I mean, if you guys can really nail those key things that hold women back honestly together what you've got is so powerful you know I'm just so excited for you guys because I feel like there's something really fresh about what you're offering um and I think you know you'll you'll really help a lot of people I'm playing a bit of devil's advocate here because when I hear about what it is that you are giving away to women in STEM, I, I kind of like trying to find the areas where women will tell themselves no. Um, and shyness and um, not using your voice and not putting yourself out there, maybe a few of the things that hold women back from getting in touch with you guys. Um, what can you say to that? Like, you know, because I feel like connecting people um, yeah. is always really difficult just because of who we are, you know, like it's scary to get in touch with people we don't know. So what would you do? What would you say to address that? I think we try to be as honest and vulnerable with people online which gives them um kind of like a relatable um yeah it makes us relatable for them so it's not as scary to approach us because even on our page uh even though we do have like our professional pictures we also try to do show um people that were we can be social as well so we're more approachable and another thing we do is 
but also very honest with our feelings about STEM. Um, you're not going to love STEM all the time, like um, Abigail said, science is hard. So we do express that as well. So I think from that, people are like, oh, yeah, I, um, yeah, I'm not the only one that doesn't like my degree right now. And they're like, OK, we can talk to these girls. Um, but also um, from Brixton, as Abigail said, and that is not what we've done is very uncommon. So um, I think it, it also shows people that, yeah, we're real girls um, and we have come from not the best background, but we still managed to achieve. So um, it does kind of make us different to if you we were approaching someone that um, was coming from a typical background, um, had all the funding. Um, yes, yeah, because we have similar stories to people who would want to approach us. And even if you don't have a similar story to us, because we're so real with it and we don't sugarcoat anything, you'd be like, okay, yeah, let's talk to these girls. So uh, System is kind of like that middleman, uh, which is why I do love it and love the name. Yeah. <laughs> now, I mean, Donna, the fact that your nails look so amazing right now, <laughs> is all that I needed to see because, you know, a woman with nails like that being an yeah. engineer is so bad. <laughs> and it exists. Like, you guys are breaking the stereotypes. Because when I was in engineering, I honestly felt odd being female because I was surrounded by a bunch of guys. And they were, that I look back now and I think the guys were intimidated by me. But I was yeah. so young and fresh and new into engineering that I was intimidated by them. So, Everybody was intimidated. And what I love about System is that you're just saying, look, it's okay to be yourself. Look at us. We're doing it. And yeah. it's working out. I mean, it's kind of like you don't even need to say anything. You just need to be yeah. enough yeah. of inspiration. Um, okay, so how do people get in touch? What are the ways? So they can contact us through our Instagram page um, at System UK. Um, so we're predominantly right now focusing on our um, Instagram, um, but then you can, you know you can send us a private message on there, or you can email us as well. We have an email address um, that we can, um, yeah. So through our email address, you can contact one, us, and then we could, um, you know, get get you just get in touch um, through there. Uh, but yeah, as we said, we want to do face-to-face -face events. We want to meet the people in real life and, you know, just whether that's in small groups, we just want to, you know, um, connect with people and just, as I said, in a relaxed environment. So uh, we want to do things differently, not the typical conference you go to with a speaker in front or panel. We want to do things in a nice environment. As we said, we are not the typical scientists and <laughs> engineers. Um, even on our Instagrams, if you just need to see it, we, you know, we love to travel. We love to, we love fashion. Yeah. We love doing our hair and our nails. Um, so we, um, yeah, we want to show that in, even in our events, we want to show that side of us as well. Yeah. Uh, we love going out and eating. <laughs> so we want to do, to also like, you know, take people out you know, and to nice places and have, just have a relaxed environment where we can now all have one common um goal or one common um interest which is stem so um so yeah so you can get in touch through instagram or through our email well that is so awesome um i while i was listening to you guys i was thinking about afb uk which is the african no association for black and ethnic minority um, engineers. Um, and the reason why I was thinking of them is because uh, we all got together earlier this year and had an event. Um, and the energy around the people was just so uplifting and so supportive and so encouraging. There wasn't a single moment where it felt competitive or everyone was kind of boasting about their achievements even though the people in the room had achieved so much there was just a real spirit of community and um, this real need to watch everybody succeed in their own way and I really get that sense from the two of you I mean I, I see that genuine um kind of love 
between you two to see each other thrive. And you're doing that for each other. And if you can do that for other women in STEM, then you know the sky's the limit for you guys. So it's been amazing getting to chat to both of you at the same time. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for all you're doing. I know that you're kind of right at the start of this journey. Um, and I'm looking forward to you guys gathering momentum and helping loads of women in STEM because you know you are absolute leaders and role models in this. So thank you. Oh, thank, thank you for you. having us. <laughs> Thanks for listening and please do subscribe to this podcast and maybe even rate and review it if you can. The more ratings and reviews, then the more interest from those trusty algorithms, which could help to increase the reach of this show. And you can watch the video recording of this conversation on YouTube on my new series called Esteemed. It's all about self-discovery, self-evolution and inclusivity on innovation. Let's all strive to be in the best versions of ourselves and celebrate others being themselves too. As always, be kind and loving, and I wish you all a great week.